San Antonio starts right now. Hi, good morning. It's Thursday, October 28th. So we want to let you know about a big lawsuit. Bucky's is suing Bucky's, and it's not the first time it's happened. Right. Uh, this article talks about how, uh, you know, the McDowell's, like on Coming to America, yep. the McDonald's. Uh, so this is kind of similar there. Uh, the nature of action portion of the lawsuit states that this is an action for trademark infringement and uh, trademark dilution, unfair competition, and false designation of origin and unjust enrichment. Let's back up for a second. Bucky's that we all know and love mm -hmm. is suing a Sugarland business uh, owner, Sareem Damani, claiming his Bucky's with a K, B U K Y S, is mm -hmm. nothing more than a knockoff. Yeah. And if you saw the sign there, real quick, it showed. Um, did we did we show it's, it? Well, right here you could see the well, way it's spelled out there right, in the right. graphic. So not even apostrophe S here, mm -hmm. but uh, you mentioned the, the, the legalese there. Mm -hmm. Both businesses are convenience and gas store chains welcoming travelers along the highway. And according to the suit, the similar logos could cause confusion in the market. There it is right there. there so oh, see, they yeah. even use the same kind of font for the sign itself. I hadn't seen the color, exact same red color there. Uh, so not the first time the company's taken other businesses it felt was benefiting from Bucky's to court. In 2018, Bucky, Bucky's won a lawsuit against Choke Canyon, proving the San Antonio-based store's alligator logo was too similar to the Bucky's Beaver. Wow, and a year before that, Bucky's sued convenience store chain Bucky's after it announced it was expanding from Nebraska to test. Texas. Now the beaver is chomping after this one in Sugarland who has chains in El Campo and Rosenberg. Now Damani says he named the store Bucky's B-U-K-Y-S after a childhood name that his friends used to call him when he was just a boy. Wow. So also in the lawsuit, Bucky's points out that it has made quite a name for itself. Yeah, for the last four decades. They're asking for injunctive relief, recovering damages, profits, and attorney's fees. A pretrial hearing is scheduled for February 4th, and the company is demanding a jury trial. We got the story from our sister station in Houston, KPRC, or uh, known as clicktohouston.com. Very similar. For now, let's look at today's Night at Nine. Another natural disaster hit southwest Louisiana. A tornado ripped through two neighborhoods in Lake Charles Wednesday, leaving behind some extensive damage. No injuries were reported. Hundreds of thousands of New Englanders are still in the dark after a nor'easter strengthened into a bomb cyclone and tore through the region. The storm drenched some areas in nearly eight inches of rain, with wind gusts reaching 74 miles per hour in parts of Massachusetts and Rhode Island. President Biden might be leaving Washington a little later than expected for a major trip overseas. The president expected to meet with Democrats on Capitol Hill this morning to figure out how to save critical parts of his massive social safety net proposal. Boeing's two-year-long nightmare with its troubled 737 MAX jets appears to be nearing an end. New reports show the company is making 19 of these planes per month. The MAX spent 20 months grounded in 2019, and 2020, after two crashes, killed 346 people. The FDA says it's changing the way it regulates breast implants. Doctors will now be required to walk patients through potential problems and have them sign off on a checklist. Comes after a testimony in 2019 from women who said their doctors did not adequately warn them about potential health complications of implants. For the first time in modern history, executives for some of the world's largest fossil fuel companies are set to testify before Congress today. The leaders will testify about climate disinformation and the alleged role their organizations have played in it. Starbucks announced it's boosting wages for workers in the U.S. The company said all its hourly employees will earn at least $15 an hour, with an average of nearly $17 an hour by next summer. Former President Donald Trump plans to attend Game 4 of the World Series in Atlanta on Saturday. The Atlanta Braves are playing the Houston Astros for the championship. The Braves are said to give Trump his own suite. He will not be sitting with any team members or MLB officials. Well-known Houston furniture store owner could take home $35 million if the Strohs win the World Series. If Mattress Mac wins, it will be the largest sports betting payout in history. His wager is only $2 million. And that's today's 9 at 9. All right, one look at the uh, one first look at the forecast here. We're looking at temperatures in the 50s, 59 degrees at the airport. Clear skies, dew point is at 40. West northwesterly winds at about eight miles per hour. And we've had those gusty. We had the gusty ones yesterday. We're going to see some more of that again today. Winds died down overnight.
but they will pick back up today out of the northwest 10 to 20 miles per hour. Temperature will be up around 76 for high this afternoon. Uh, looking at uh, the lows this morning, we did drop down to 51 here in San Antonio, 55 Bernie Stage, 42 in Kerrville, 54 in New Braunfels, 46 Rock Springs, and 50 in Del Rio. So it was a chilly start. Here's a look at some of the headlines. Some gusts up to 35 miles per hour today with those northwesterly winds. And tonight we drop down into the 40s. A lot of us will be in the 40s. So a chilly start to your Friday. And then for Halloween, as it stands right now, trick or treating temperatures in the 70s. We can deal with that. Clear skies should be really pretty nice. We're going to take a deeper dive into that weekend forecast. Talk about some damage yesterday from some tornadoes, too. That's coming up here in just a little bit. But let's toss it over to Steven now with an update on some traffic issues. Yeah, we've been seeing a few issues out there. Justin, good morning. Right now, the roads do look like they are pretty much normal now, but we did have a few problems out there. Let's go ahead and take a look though around town, see how things have been shaping up throughout the morning. You can see if we can move the camera a little bit closer. That gives us a closer look at 410 at Starcrest. We do have a few folks out there. Traffic looks normal, but let's take you to the map because we do have some problems that are still lingering around. Some traffic delays there off of Loop 410 eastbound at Babcock. That is because a crash was detected there a few hours earlier, but it looks like it has since cleared out. But something that has not cleared out are those traffic delays. So make sure that you're being careful or packing that patience this morning. Taking a jump over here, we do have another crash off I-35 northbound at Loop 410. Looks like that may have resolved as well, and it looks like the lanes there are nice and green. Obviously something that we like to see. But taking a jump down here, we had a big mess off I-35 northbound right at Martin Street, where traffic was building in those northbound lanes due to another crash. So again, these crashes look like they have cleared out, and the map shows that it's pretty nice and quiet, uh, uh, but we're going to continue to watch these roads closely. As always, make sure that you're driving safely and make sure you pack those sunglasses today. Looks pretty sunny, guys. Stephen, thank you so much for the update, sir. 904 right now. Top stories this morning. San Antonio police say a man is recovering after two people tried to break into his house overnight. It happened around 10 last night in the 4800 block of Castle Stream, just north of Gibbs Sprawl Road on the city's northeast side. Police say the man heard banging on the front door, and when he went to open it, two suspects tried to kick in that door. Police say those suspects then started shooting through that door, hitting the victim in the hip. He got away through a side window and was taken to the hospital. The suspects got away. We have new details on a tragic crime out of Houston, and we have to warn you before we begin here, we have some uh, details that are considered graphic. Officials in Houston say a child that was found dead in an abandoned apartment with his siblings was murdered. That's right. The child's mother, Gloria Williams, and her boyfriend, Brian Coulter, have been arrested. Here are their mugshots. Coulter charged with murder. Williams charged with injury to a child by omission and tampering with evidence involving a human corpse. Officials say the child, who was eight years old at the time of his death, had multiple blunt force injuries. He is believed to have died around Thanksgiving of last year. But the body was found earlier this week after a 15-year-old called authorities. That sibling was living in the apartment with his seven and nine-year-old siblings. The teen says his parents hadn't lived there for months. Authorities say the two younger kids appeared malnourished and show signs of physical injury. All three were taken to a hospital for treatment. They're now in emergency custody of the Texas Department of Family and Protective Services. The community of Kerrville is remembering those killed in a drag racing event this past weekend. A visitation services for one of the children killed were held yesterday to say a final goodbye to eight-year-old Santiago Martinez. Police all have gathered for a vigil up in Kerrville last night. They prayed for the three lives lost and the five others who were hurt. Autumn Pender is a mother of three, and she was at the event with her three sons who are around the same age as six-year-old Daniel Trujillo Jones and eight-year-old Santiago Martinez, who died during the event on Saturday. I guess it just hits really close to home when you have your own kids. You have to make sure that you tell your kids you love them every single day because they could just be gone. Six others were hospitalized. One of them, 46-year-old Rebecca Cedillo, passed away yesterday from her injuries. Police continue to investigate, but have said there are no criminal charges pending in the case. In your other morning headlines, latest on that movie set shooting, and someone gets banned from American Airlines. Plus, a popular costume causing controversy in New York. Jonathan Cotto is here now to explain all of this this morning. Good morning. morning. That's right. Good morning, Mark. Good morning, Stephanie. Well, we start off with new information about the deadly mistakes made on the set of the movie Rust in New Mexico last week. The film's assistant director told authorities he failed to fully check the gun he handed to actor Alec Baldwin. As a result, Baldwin accidentally shot and killed one person 
and injured another. And a newly released affidavit assistant director Dave Hawes told detectives he usually checks the barrel for obstructions and most of the time there is no live fire. Hawes told police he only remembers seeing three rounds in the gun. Hannah Gutierrez, the person in charge of prop weapons, says no live ammo is ever kept on set. But Santa Fe police say otherwise. The facts are clear. Uh, a weapon was handed to uh, Mr. Baldwin. The weapon is functional and fired a live round, killing Ms. Hutchins and injuring Mr. Souza. How did a live round wind up in that gun? That is the question I want to know as a DA. Who's responsible for that? Did someone fail to do their job? That's where you're going to see potential criminal negligence. Now, police say the weapon used by Baldwin was the only working gun of three seized by police from the movie set. No charges have been filed, but the district attorney says involuntary, involuntary manslaughter charges could be considered in this case, pending the outcome of the investigation. Now to California, where passengers on an American Airlines flight landed with a pretty wild story to tell. The airline says a passenger physically assaulted one of their flight attendants. American says the plane took off from JFK in New York before landing in Orange County, California. Officials say the alleged violence happened during the journey. The flight diverted to Denver, where police boarded and arrested the, sus the suspect. Other passengers on the plane recalled the moment. I understand that he actually punched her twice. I did see her walk back down the aisle afterwards. She had blood splattered on the outside of her mask. If you're not prepared to wear a mask, you're not prepared to fly, is kind of the moral of the story. That was why he was angered, was because I also, there was an impression that there might be a substance or alcohol involved um, in terms of men hitting women. It's absolutely absurd and ridiculous. Other passengers say there was a doctor on that flight who was able to help the flight attendant. She was taken to the hospital. In a statement, American Airlines says the passenger will never fly with them again. Now to the Big Apple, where a debate is underway about a popular Netflix series. We're talking about Squid Game, which is a Korean survival drama about people in debt hoping to win a bundle of cash competing in kids' games. The show is violent, which is why three elementary schools near Syracuse, New York, are banning Squid Game costumes. A superintendent for a New York school that is not banning the costume says what the others are doing is a slippery slope. One of the things we've been hearing about um, in, in school districts all across the country is children coming to school and playing squid games on the playground. It's never appropriate to play at harming one another, and that, that, that really is the sort of guiding principle here. And well, odds are you'll have one of these characters trick-or-treating at your door this year. Jonathan, thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Time now is 9.10, and it's about 59 degrees out there. So ahead on GMSA at 9. Good morning. We're just a day away from the big celebration for Dia de Muertos, but really for some, for some flower farmers, the preparations start months in advance. We're talking about June, July, and all this for the beautiful marigold flowers. The story just ahead here on GMSA at 9. On every day of the dead altar, there are yellow and orange petals whose distinct scent help lead the souls of our departed loved ones to the altars prepared by family and friends. Marigold flowers originate in Mexico, but here in our area is a well-kept secret that ships out hundreds of thousands of blooms that help keep the tradition alive for so many families. Alicia Beretta traveled to Wimberley, where marigolds are in full bloom just in time for the big celebration. Good morning, Alicia. Good morning. Well, these are the same marigolds that you find in central markets and many HEVs across the state of Texas. But really to make this work happen, to make the magic happen, the work starts back in June to grow more than 300,000 stems. And then three weeks leading up to Dia de Muertos, it's the star of the show at Arnosky Family Farms. They grow year round, but the month of October is the big push for the Sempasuchil or marigold flower. We've got 300,000 plants going out. The Arnosky story began back in the early 90s with just a few plants and flowers. Well, as a, as a cut flower grower, we grow everything that we think can possibly grow. So you've experimented over the years. We've been growing flowers since 1993. 
and we've tried everything that you can grow. And the Day of the Dead flower is a perfect match as it thrives in the Texas heat, but Pam and Frank never thought this flower would become one of the most coveted by visitors. As we started growing the marigolds and then the people came to us and said, we see you have marigolds, let me tell you about Dia de los Muertos. And we learned about it from the people in San Antonio and from reading and traveling in Mexico. We understood that there was this connection, that we were the farm that could grow these flowers for San Antonio. Now their marigolds are sent off statewide, from the Rio Grande Valley up to Midland, to adorn the altars that will welcome the souls of the departed on November 1st and 2nd, including the community altar in the Arnosky's Blue Barn. We all put up an ofrenda in the barn, quite a large one, and it gets more beautiful because, of course, we have more flowers than anybody. All right, stand by. Well, the Arnoski say that this is what it's all about, sharing the culture and honoring traditions that so many, that is so special to so many. And the Arnoski say that they're honored to be able to be this farm. And tomorrow, you guys, the preparations are already underway for the Dia de los Muertos River Walk Parade. It's going to be absolutely beautiful. Tomorrow, we'll also hear more from the Arnoskis and really the group they attribute all these marigolds to. There was a group that came about 25 five years ago to ask if they could continue to grow more of these marigolds. And again, now they're selling them at HEB and at Central Market. So they have just expanded like they never dreamed of. Back to you guys. A uh, lovely story and a yeah. beautiful morning down there at Arneson River Theater, Alicia. Absolutely. Yes, you match very nice. It is with so beautiful. Then. It's nice and cool. Beautiful Thank weather. you, guys. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Alicia. All right, 59 degrees. It was a chilly morning and even colder out in the Texas Hill Country this morning, Justin. Yes, we dropped down into the 40s. It was a. It felt like fall, finally. Yes. And we're going to have a couple mornings like this as we head into the weekend. And you just saw the preparations there for the River Parade tomorrow night. Let's give you a forecast for your heading out. Temperatures will be perfect in the 60s, uh, potentially even falling into the 50s by the time things are winding down. Northwesterly winds 5 to 10 miles per hour, so winds will be lighter. Should be perfect. And as we look at the pollen count, I want to throw this in here because we have something interesting jumping in here. Juniper showed up in the moderate category today. Why is that a big deal? Because, and I even hate to say the word, mountain cedar is ash juniper. When juniper shows up, it can be a precursor to mountain cedar. Now, obviously, it's a little early for that, but if there's juniper in the air, that could tell us that we're starting to see some of that ash juniper. Just a heads up. We won't hopefully see mountain cedar in the pollen count, uh, you know, next couple of weeks, but we'll see that uh, it's not a great sign, I suppose. Yesterday, we had those big storms come through. Some storm reports uh, out uh, to our east. We mentioned that you saw some video earlier around Lake Charles. There was an EF2 tornado there. There were two injuries reported, so that's a new update. We also had some reports of damage in Orange. That's far east Texas, and then there was a report of a tornado just north of Houston in the spring area, too. So it was busy east of us yesterday. Thankfully, we didn't see much of the severe weather, just got some rain out of it. And now in the wake of it, some cool air. 55 Bernie stage this morning, 42 in Kerrville. We got down to 51 in San Antonio. Even Carissa Springs dropped down to 46 a little bit earlier today. We're starting to turn the corner now. Temperatures are on their way up. 59 at the airport, west northwesterly winds at about 8 miles per hour. And most of us are in the 50s right now. 55 Castroville, 56 in Bandera, 53 in Comfort. We have made it into the 60s in New Braunfels, 61 degrees there, 56 down in Catula. And dew points, as you might imagine, are really low. The air is extremely dry, and that doesn't really change. High temperatures today should make it up to about 78. That's perfect. 77 in New Braunfels, 84 Carrizo Springs. It'll be a fantastic day, minus the wind. The wind will be back. We lost it overnight, but it picks up again this afternoon. And we'll uh, put the forecast forward here to 3 o'clock. Notice we've got some gusts up around 40 miles per hour, especially north and east of San Antonio. That's where winds will be the strongest. But even here in town, we can see some gusts to 35. Tonight, those winds die down with the light winds, clear skies, dry air. We'll get another cool morning. I think it'll be cooler tomorrow morning than it is uh, than it was this morning. Wind advisories have been posted for our far eastern and northeastern counties. Uh, so that's where the winds will be strongest to northeast of San Antonio up towards Dallas as this system moves away. Rest of today, temperatures again up around 78. We fall quickly tonight into the 60s and eventually 50s by midnight. 
The extended forecast will go 75 tomorrow with gusts to 25. It'll be breezy, but not as windy. 79 Saturday, 82 for Halloween on Sunday. Trick or treating looks like we'll see temperatures in the 70s. And then next week, humidity returns and some rain chances do too. You have the dancing mummy. For He's, back. He's yeah. back. I He's like back. it. We got to bring him back every year. Yes, we do. Yeah. All right. We'll talk more about this juniper situation later on. Yes, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> 921. About, I didn't mean to sound like a dad there, Justin. I'm sorry. I was a little scared, actually. <laughs> about <laughs> 61 <laughs> degrees. And we all remember the February winter storm that caused widespread power outages across the state. As a result, you could be seeing a rate increase on your energy bill. Ahead on GMSA at 9, find out how Congressman Joaquin Castro is responding and what it means for you. Dia de los Muertos is just around the corner, which means that the preparations are in full swing to honor, celebrate, and welcome back your loved one who has passed away. And we want to hear from you. Share with us your must-have items for your ofrendas or altars, and also tell us a little bit about the people that you are honoring this year on Day of the Dead. So we want you to submit those pictures at the link below, and we hope that you'll celebrate this holiday with us. And we'll share those pictures and stories on KSAT News Now on Dia de Muertos or Day of the Dead. And welcome back. It's 925. CPS Energy customers could see a rate increase to pay a $1 billion bill due to natural gas price hikes during the February freeze. That prompted San Antonio Congressman Joaquin Castro to do a bill to stop price gouging during those kinds of emergencies. Sarah Costa finds out if it passed and what that would mean for you. February's storm caused major shortages to the natural gas supply chain and prices skyrocketed by 10,000 percent. It's why Congressman Joaquin Castro introduced a bill today that would prevent natural gas price gouging during a declared emergency. If that emergency comes around, it's going to help keep the bill, uh, bills lower uh, through limiting the extent to which natural gas sales can, ex um, can accelerate um, in these various marketplaces. Dr. Taylor Collins, the economic chair at the University of Incarnate Word, says if passed, yes, this would benefit consumers from seeing those prices in the future end up on their utility bills. However, he says it's not fixing the root causes. But those underlying problems are still there and still do expose us to blackouts that come from extreme weather environments like this. A professor at Trinity University agrees. He says it's a Band-Aid solution. He believes the focus needs to be on winterizing equipment to prevent the supply shortage in the first place. That's really what they should be doing, right? Making sure we got enough supply of gas during uh, winter storms rather than capping the price. It's still uncertain if CPS Energy customers will be paying for those natural gas price hikes from February. CPS Energy is more than likely to propose a rate increase in the near future. The latest working estimate is around 8.2%. It's important to note that not all of that rate increase is from the winter storm. Some of it is from overdue customer bills and also much needed infrastructure upgrades. Now, any rate increase from CPS Energy would have to be approved by City Council. I'm Sarah Costa, KSAT 12 News. Sarah also tells us if the bill passes, it would be up to the Commodity Futures Trading Commission to determine what the ceiling would be on natural gas prices. And there's a lot more ahead on GMSA at 9. Just ahead, Eric Hernandez joins us to talk about a murder trial that we've been following closely all week. It came to an end last night, and she's standing by with the details. Let's check the roads again real quick right now. Traffic is flowing, and no see backups. Don't see any backups, rather, right now at I-10 at Crossroads, uh, neither at 281 at 410. We'll be back. A trial we've been covering all week came to an end last night. Louis Benevento found guilty of the 2019 murder of his wife, Alicia Wills. Eric Hernandez joins us now to talk about this trial and how many years he's going to have to serve in prison. And first of all, Erica, what was your first impression of the trial? Um, well, this trial started on Monday and it went through very quickly. And I thought both sides presented a pretty good case. We, you know, the defense was claiming self-defense and then the state said, no, it's not exactly how it appears. So this is um, 
Again, he was found guilty yesterday. And I was surprised with the jury only taking two and a half hours to come with that, come back with that decision. Let's talk about that self-defense claim that Wills attacked him first. How was the state able to prove otherwise? So Benevento did take the stand yesterday and he kind of painted this picture that as soon as she came home for that day, she attacked him. She, you know, it was an argument that kind of just escalated from there into the point where he which he admitted to shooting her in self-defense because he claimed that she pointed a gun at him first. The state was saying throughout the entire time his story was changing, that, that what he said on the stand yesterday was different from what he told police that night and was different as far as there was new details that he was saying that he had never mentioned before either. And then he was contradicting himself as well. Um, there was some surveillance footage from a neighbor's uh, I guess, security camera from their home. And he had claimed that they had been in and out of the house several times that, that day. But according to that surveillance video, he was only in and out maybe once or twice. And at one point with a gun in his hand, which he said he didn't have. And that that video wasn't accurate. So I think just because of those inconsistencies and, and sh sh the details that he told police and what he told police that night that it happened was what um, led the jury to find him guilty. And we understand the punishment phase began right after the verdict. How did that go and how long was he sentenced? Yeah, so each side had a uh, one or two witnesses for the punishment phase. On the state side, it was uh, Wills' son. And then on the state side, I mean, on the defense side, it was Benevento again, as well as Wills' mother, um, who she had called right before she was shot. Um, and, you know, they were accepted the verdict, but they were hoping that he would get a minimum of five years and he actually was sentenced to 15 years. What can we expect next as far as trials go? It's still, it's gonna get very busy, especially going into November right now. We still have another murder trial taking place in the 379th, the Miguel Gutierrez trial we mentioned last week when it started. We're still following that one. And then we have some big trials coming up in November. We have Roy Hernandez, who is accused of the 1999 murder of his wife. He wasn't arrested until 2016 when he was finally charged with that murder. And then we also have Andre McDonald coming up. As of right now, it is set for November 8th. But that could change November 5th when another hearing com comes into play to decide if they'll be ready for the 8th or a continuance would be called. Sounds like the DA's office is trying to clear some cases before the end of the year. Yeah, there's a huge backlog and I see, I'm seeing like right now this week we had two murder trials. Mm -hmm. I'm going to see, I think we're going to see that more going throughout the rest of the year with several high profile and big trials taking place at the same time. All right, Erica, thank you for joining us today. Thank you guys. Thank you, Erica. Outside with live cam, chilly starts, slowly warming up. That The breeze was also a little cool, but nowhere near as windy and gusty as yesterday. No, thank goodness, but those winds will pick back up again today. We had a little bit of a wind chill in spots this morning, but not much. It was almost enough to use a heater in your car for, you know, a couple minutes. Uh, but it will be nice this afternoon. We'll jump back into the 70s. So let's go outside for you. There's the scene. Blue skies. And at the moment, winds are still fairly light out of the west northwest at about eight miles per hour. We're at 59 here in San Antonio right now. Here's another look at that pollen count. And I mentioned this earlier. Molds are moderate. Juniper shows up today in the moderate category, and it does have a connection to Mount Cedar. We, we did get a sort of a northwesterly wind yesterday. Mount Cedar is in the same family as Juniper. It's ash juniper. So that's sort of a precursor, unfortunately. Well, at least that's the way it looks. Uh, potentially some cedar in the in the pollen count. We'll keep you posted there. Meantime, forecast for today, we bring the wind back. Northwesterly winds 10 to 20 miles per hour and gusty will be up around 78 degrees with sunny skies this afternoon. We're going to take a look at the football forecast and a couple of other forecasts coming up. Uh, Halloween forecasts uh, in particular coming up here in just a few minutes, guys. Looking forward to that. Thank you, Justin. A quick look at the roads with Trans Sky. There's a look there at I-35 at Maine. Things are moving there and also off of Highway 90. They are dealing with their own surge. A local psychiatric and substance abuse hospital dealing with a surge of admissions. Laurel Ridge Treatment Center attributes this to the increase in mental health needs in the community due to COVID-19. Tiffany Huertas has more on how they're adjusting and what other facilities across the country are facing.
We have had at times where we're on uh, at full capacity. Jacob Quayar, the CEO of Laurel Ridge Treatment Center, says this influx of patients is due to COVID-19. So we do have individuals who are waiting uh, and pending a bed um, for placement. But we saw a three times uh, rate of increase um, in depression. We've seen about a 30 percent in increase in anxiety related disorders and a very significant increase in um, what we call deaths from despair. Last year, they opened a new hospital across the street from their facility. We saw several indicators that were going to suggest that we're going to have an elevation in the need for behavioral health care treatment. And so we opened our new hospital in October of last year, and it's at full capacity. Cuellar says they hired about 100 staff members to help with this influx of patients. Sean Coughlin, the president and CEO of the National Association for Behavioral Health Care, says facilities across the country are facing several issues, including dealing with workforce shortages. There is uh, clearly an, an increased demand and need for our services, um, and it's absolutely running head first into these workforce issues. Coughlin says it's been challenging for people seeking services. The people need access to these services, and we're finding they're just being delayed or cannot find those, or cannot find access. Tiffany Huertas, KSAT 12 News. And this morning, we are talking about the new episode of KSAT Explains. You can see it right now on KSAT.com. Here's our Myra Arthur with a preview. A new episode out right now of KSAT Explains focuses on domestic violence. Of course, it is Domestic Violence Awareness Month, but this is a pervasive problem 365 days a year in our community. We are highlighting some of the survivor stories from two brave women who were we were fortunate enough to meet, and they were brave enough to talk about what they went through to try to share hope and guidance with others, especially about the resources they use to get to where they are now. Brina Monterosa, producer here, on KSAT Explains, talking about the, the resource, the Family Justice Center, where you went, you took a tour, you met a lot of people doing some tough work. Yeah, so the Family Justice Center has been around since 2005 in Bear County, and you know we've done several stories with them in the past for domestic violence, and you know I never knew exactly what they did. So they offer not only legal help that you would assume, you know, as a justice center connected to the DA's office, you know, by offering protective orders and all of that, but they also offer uh, counseling, you know, child care. If, if a victim, you know, needs to come see them, but they don't have child care, they don't want a victim to be deterred, you know, um, to still come in and get help. They have food and clothing, things you don't think about that if someone's mm -hmm. trying to leave an abusive relationship, they're just going to leave and might not have anything. So they provide those resources and, and connect them if they need to to other organizations in the community. And, and that's one of the examples from one of the women we talked to. She had to leave at a moment's notice. So like you said, there are groups out there providing that help that you really don't think of that so many of these victims need in order to become survivors. That's the purpose of this episode. KSAT explains from victim to survivor, not only talking about those resources that we have here in Bear County in San Antonio, but what we can all do if we know someone who we believe is in an abuse relationship. Awareness and compassion go a very long way. That is a key to this episode. Go check it out right now. KSAT.com slash explains where you can watch it anytime on demand on the KSAT TV app. 939 about 62 degrees. You're watching GMSA at 9. The rising cost of child care is causing problems for families and child care providers across the country. After the break, the impact it's having on child care here in the Alamo City. And welcome back. It's 943. Child care costs a lot and some families pay more than their mortgage. And that's why the Biden administration is proposing something called the American Families Plan. Under it, low and middle income families could better afford child care, but even that wouldn't be a complete solution. As Patty Santos explains, child care providers are also trying to keep up with the cost. A typical mortgage is what, 1200 bucks for a nice three bedroom, two bath house. So, yeah. you, you know, you can buy two of those. <laughs> for what daycare is costing. And here we are renters. So. Yeah, yeah, we don't have that luxury just yeah. yet. The MoFats, parents of three under three, are making difficult decisions and sacrifices for their family, careers, and future to be able to afford childcare. After you think about it, it's just like, oh my goodness, let's have children, you know? <laughs> but no, you don't think of 
the price of daycare and how expensive it could be. Both have college degrees. Donye works in marketing and LaQuantra as a teacher. I would definitely like uh, middle class for sure. Um, definitely over the six figure mark and childcare still is just as expensive as us to anybody else. According to Child Care Aware of America, the cost of daycare in Texas is almost as much as tuition at a four-year college, just under 10000 for infants. Texas couples living in the poverty line pay 72% of their income on child care. Where do you sit? Owner of Books and Bibs, Stephanie Gray, says child care teachers are some of the lowest paid workers. The main thing is if you could go to McDonald's and make $12 or $15 an hour, why do you want to work in child care and make $11 an hour? Indeed.com has the average hourly pay for child care workers in Texas at under $11. Grace says the labor shortage is hurting pay raise potentials. It is really a shame. Early childhood educators get paid so little to be like they're the stepping stone of what your kids are learning for the future. She has 13 workers and just over 60 kids. She says the cost of running a business includes insurance, supplies, toys, now cleaning supplies. Still, the big chunk goes to payroll. She thinks federal funds could be a band-aid to the high cost of child care. I don't know exactly what it would take to make it a permanent fix, but this would definitely help. Federal lawmakers have not yet detailed the plan on how the money, if approved, would trickle down to the centers and workers. That was Patty Santos reporting. Here in Texas, some estimates show 30% of kids are growing up in a single parent home. The good news, there are programs to help, help rather struggling families right now. And coming up tonight on the Night Beat, we'll tell you about an effort aimed at increasing the labor force in the service industry by providing free child care. It's a program not many people know about, but it is available now. Look for more on that story tonight on the Night Beat at 10. And for now, let's go ahead and check back with Justin. We can talk about Juniper, but also the nice weather. The nice weather, and yeah. he has a fall foliage update. Yeah, I feel like I hit a nerve with that Juniper thing, so we'll just move on from that. Uh, we'll talk more about some uh, happy things. <laughs> Lost Maples, uh, beautiful this time of year. Now, keep in mind, you have to get online and book a day pass because it gets really crowded, and they only let a certain amount of people in to the state natural area. But it is, uh, it is starting to look better and better. So this is the October 27th report. They're saying, according to the Texas Parks and Wildlife, the reds are in the sumac, the yellow is showing up in the maples, and they did get an inch of rain with this last system, along with some cooler weather. So that helps the process, right, of the, the color change. Peak color is uh, typically the first two weeks of November, so next week. I'm sure a lot of people will be there this weekend, but next couple of weeks you'll really start to see it. And again, you got to book those day passes online. So just an update there on Lost Maples if you have plans to head out there. Outside, we've got clear skies. 59 at the airport, 59 stints and 59 Kelly, up to 62 at Randolph. Right now, winds are pretty light out of the west, northwest, anywhere from 5 to 10 miles per hour. Uh, it is a beautiful morning, but I'll warn you, the winds will pick up again this afternoon. 61 in Boulevardi, 62 Canyon Lake, 57 Comfort, 59 right now in Hondo, 56 out in Del Rio. We've got some 60s down there in Carrizo Springs after starting off pretty chilly this morning. Dew points, they stay low through the weekend. The weekend is going to be really, really nice. Even on Sunday, the dew point rises to about 47, so there's a little bit more humidity there, but you won't feel it. Probably not until Monday and Tuesday where we start to see the, the changes with that added humidity, more cloud cover and such. Temperatures today up around 78 here in San Antonio. If you're watching us from Gonzales this morning, your high is 76. You'll get into the 80s in places like Catula and Carrizo Springs, staying in the 70s up around Fredericksburg. And I mentioned those winds. They start to pick up by about lunchtime, and by 3 p.m., we're seeing some gusts. These are the forecast gusts close to 40. New Braunfels, Fredericksburg, down to Gonzales and Howitzville. Here in San Antonio, gusts probably to about 35. And then as you go south and west, the winds fall off a little bit. Still breezy, though, no matter where you go. And then by, we, by the time we get into tonight, those winds do start to calm. And with clear skies, we're going to see some chilly numbers tomorrow morning. Wind advisories are in place for uh, locations like Austin, LaGrange, Howitzville, down to Victoria. So our far eastern counties here, and then those wind advisories stretch up towards Dallas and Oklahoma City. That's where the pressure gradient is tightest, right behind our storm system here, and there are wind advisories posted for those areas as well. Forecast for today, we make it up to 78 for a high. Northwesterly winds 10 to 20 miles per hour, and then falling off into the 60s and 50s tonight. If you're heading out to 
Some football games looks fantastic. Clear skies. Winds hopefully calm a little bit by that time and we dip down into the 60s. You may even want to take the jacket with you if you're heading out tonight. And let's get a quick preview of trick or treating. Temperatures will be in the 70s and upper 60s both Saturday and Sunday. If you have plans, uh, obviously a lot of people do get out and trick or treat. So here's the extended forecast 75 Friday, 79 Saturday, 82 Sunday, 82 Monday, and then we will get some changes next week, I think, with some chances of rain by Wednesday. Does it not look like Justin Horn in silhouette? <laughs> the mummy? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, he's got the moves. He's tall. And he does have moves. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So we do have that in common. Take, yeah, take credit for that. <laughs> 950, about 64 degrees. And here's a look at what's coming up tomorrow on GMSA. What happens when you see someone litter on Texas roads? There's a new app that lets you tattle on them. I'm Sarah Costa coming up tomorrow on GMSA. How you can report them and what TxDOT will send them. The Eternals took over London last night for the premiere of the latest Marvel superhero movie. Angelina Jolie plays one of the title characters, a fierce warrior named Thena. She took her kids to the Hollywood premiere last week and says they liked it, but she was nervous. You know, as a mom, you get in a, in a tight gold suit and you jump around and you think I'm either going to completely embarrass my children or maybe, maybe they'll think it's a little cool. So I'm lucky. Eternals will be in theaters November 5th. All of this is really new to me. Out today at season two of Love Life, the HBO Max anthology series about love and dating stars The Good Place's William Jackson Harper. He takes over the season from Anna Kendrick. While on Paramount Plus, it's the debut of the new animated series, Star Trek Prodigy. Nobody's going to take my animals. It's our first look at Tiger King 2, and if the trailer's accurate, get ready for a lot more cat fights. The series took the world by storm at the beginning of the pandemic. Adios, Joe. Five new episodes premiere on Netflix November 17th. And a couple of Oscar winners with birthdays today, Julia Roberts turning 54, while Joaquin Phoenix is 47. And that's what's happening in Hollywood. I'm Jason Athens in ABC News, Los Angeles. All right, one last thing of the forecast. We're in the 60s now, 78 this afternoon, 75 tomorrow. Couple of nice days here, but it will be fairly windy this afternoon. Everything looks good this weekend for any outdoor plans you have. So the Spurs won their season opener, and I said that Steph was their lucky rabbit's foot mm -hmm. because she was at the game. What are some of the most common superstitions in every state? Rabbit's foot is on the list yes, in some states. But not in Texas. Not Texas. Let's tell you about Texas. Texas is actually the pennies. Lucky uh, pennies. Lucky pennies. Yeah. And, and it's funny because, like, well, I mean, I grew up in Texas, and that was one thing that, you know, my father was like, you know, yes, pick that penny up. Find it's, a penny, penny, pick it up, know, then all day you'll have good have luck. Have good luck, yeah. And right. I, I still find myself doing that. So that's the top one here. Some of the other ones in other states, like uh, many, many states, throw sh salt over your shoulder. Mm -hmm. which is, of course, just supposed to counter the fact if you spill salt. <laughs> yes, and, and, and put it in your shoulder instead. That's actually <laughs> that's actually 17 states. 17 yeah, states. Yeah, that's a lot of in, them that believe in, in that. All. Uh, yeah, so that's one of them. Uh, crossing your fingers to walk under a ladder. Let's see here. Some of the other ones. Uh, let's see. Second most popular. Uh, analysis was which one? Oh, bad luck comes in threes. threes. Yeah, so when we talk about bad luck, it's also, you know, there's good luck, there's also bad luck. So there are a lot of states that believe in this particular what uh, is, superstition. What is the, the ladybug thing? Ladybug? Oh, that's supposed to be good luck. Oh, yeah. That if, if, a, if a ladybug lands, lands on, on you. Well, yeah, yeah, so I've heard that You're before. You're not supposed to kill But Texas, ladybugs. it's all about the penny. Yeah. We'd rather have good luck than bad luck. For me, Abe has to, I was telling Justin, yeah. Ab Abraham Lincoln has to be face up or it's no good. What? That's true. Yep. That's too yeah. specific. Mm -hmm. Have a good day. <laughs>